This meeting is being recorded. Welcome everyone. We're just going to get started in a few minutes. So I'll just wait for people to join. Hi everyone, we're gonna get started in just a minute. I'll just wait for everyone to join. Thank you. We'll wait a couple more, another 30 seconds or so. Right, I think we'll get going. So Tenakoto everyone, uh, welcome today. My name's Kath Lomax and I'm the Chief Client Officer here at Fisher Funds. So it's great to have you join us for the webinar this afternoon. And today I'm joined by some of our key investment teams. So welcome to Ash, Sam, Robbie and Quinn. Welcome guys. Um, so as many of you know, Fisher Funds provides managed funds in KiwiSaver uh, for over 250,000 clients. And we're all about helping our clients in their investment journey and to achieve the goals that they set out to achieve. So it's been a really exciting time here at Fisher Funds um, with the conditional purchase of Kiwi Wealth um, earlier in the year. And also we had great celebrations on Friday night with our amazing client services team who won over seven awards at the CRM Awards, um, including the top award for financial services. So big congratulations to that team. Uh, on top of that, uh, both of our KiwiSaver schemes have been awarded CanStar Outstanding Value Awards for the third year running um, as, our, as active investment managers, like we're really passionate about providing exceptional value for our clients. So we're really looking forward to continuing to help our clients and Kiwis, um, both with managed funds and KiwiSaver. So really, what's today about? We know it's been a really challenging year um, for investors in 2022. And this is what the purpose of the webinar is about, is to really give you the opportunity to ask your questions, which we've already had plenty of. So thank you very much. Um, and find out what we're doing, how we're approaching things, and really, yeah, answer those questions. If we don't get to your question, um, we will follow up with you later, um, but please also make sure that you ask questions as we go. So down the very bottom of your screen, uh, you'll see a Q&A button. If you ask your question there, um, we'll do our very best to answer it. If we don't get to your questions, uh, we have a great team here, not only our award-winning client services team, but also a great team of advisors um, that can answer any of the questions that you have. So a couple of things before I start firing all the questions team, um, just a reminder, your um, attendance isn't visible to anybody else. Um, the webinar is recorded today, so we'll be able to send that out at a later date. And the webinar today is information only, so it doesn't take into account your own personal situation um, or any financial advice, but that's what we've got the team here at Fisher Funds for. So um, let's get going. Ash, I'm going to start a question for you. Um, and this is quite a lot of, um, you know, sums up quite a few of the questions that we've had so far, which seems to be a lot of uncertainty in the world right now impacting markets like inflation, Ukraine, Europeans, uh, Europe's energy crisis and a weakening housing market. Just how unusual is the backdrop and how concerned should investors be? Great. Well, well, thanks for that, Kath. And it's, it's certainly a good question to kick off with because there's been a, a huge amount going on this year. So I'll, I'll cover that shortly. But but first of all, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ashley Gard. I'm Chief Investment Officer here at Fisher Funds. Um, it's great to have so many people on. I can see that the number ticking up there at the moment. Yeah. Already we've got over 100 questions. So that's that's great. Um, but look, it has been a highly unusual period of market. So we had a, a very volatile year this year after you know many years of smooth sailing. We, we almost had a 10-year bull market there with a bit of an interruption from COVID. But it's been an unusual period because we've been, been grappling with issues we haven't had to grapple with for a long time. So inflation, rising interest rates, uh, you know, war in Ukraine, these are things that markets haven't had to contend with for a, for a long, long time. Actually, the last 10 years was actually contending with low interest rates and, and really low inflation. So, so it is in a we're in a sort of different space now. 
Um, and perhaps not only is it a different space, but also if you contrast this year to uh, this time last year, things are, are really quite significantly di different. So in June last year, the official cash rate, which is the interest rate the central bank here in New Zealand sets, was 0.25%. Um, inflation was still 3.3%. We had a bull market in the share market. We had New Zealand housing prices still going higher and global central banks are talking about inflation being transitory. So um, we know now that's a lot different than where we are now. And since then we had our central bank start by hiking interest rates. Um, then we had a war breakout in Ukraine and with it we had oil prices and food prices go higher, which caused global inflation and it caused global central banks to finally start hiking interest rates. And all of that interest rate activity has started to cause people to talk about um, the risk of recession. So again, that's something that we haven't had talk of for quite some time. Um, and we'll get to this in a bit more detail shortly, but that's obviously driven a, um, a bear market with global share markets falling by, by more than 20% this year. Um, but I guess to your question about how concerned invest investors should be, I guess we have these sort of unique situations quite regularly in markets. So two years ago, it was COVID. Um, no one saw that happening. And when it did, no one knew how it would play out. Before that, we had the US-China trade war. Um, before that, you know, the sovereign debt crisis. So there's always something that investors can be worried about. And I guess the, the main point I'd want to make is actually when investors are, are the most worried, that's actually the time to realize that a lot of that worry is already in the price. So with markets being down 20% this year, that already reflects a lot of concern. And often the time you want to be most concerned in markets is actually when everything's rosy, going really well, um, prices are high, and no one can see any risks on the horizon. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, definitely um, good advice there in terms of that. And um, I think sometimes it's it's harder to see that though, right? So Quinn, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question around why interest rates have been rising. And how high um, do we think that uh, interest rates and inflation should uh, could go? Uh, yeah, thanks, Kath. Well, um, you know, it's got it's got a lot to do with inflation, uh, which is certainly back in the headlines after a prolonged uh, absence. And um, like no, no doubt, many of you have read and, and probably felt inflation has raced higher over the over the last uh, year, and it's probably the highest it's been you know in, in almost uh, thirty years. And Inflation, it impacts on interest rates um, because it reduces your purchasing power. So you can think about inflation almost like a tax on your cash. So this means that, you know, when inflation is moving up, interest rates also move up because people want to be compensated for that, you know, loss of purchasing power. And, you know, there is plenty of debate about, you know, the outlook for inflation and what that means uh, for interest rates. But I think, you know, inflation will likely fall over the next uh 12 months and, and not least because of that rise in central bank uh, interest rates that uh, Ash referred to. And that'll start to you know, curb that borrowing and spending behavior that happens in a low interest rate environment. And um, it's not just that, uh, we've seen commodity prices, you know, they've come down from their high levels. So thinking about oil and thinking about certain industrial metals such as copper. And um, perhaps we haven't seen it at the, uh, the checkout counter just yet, although I think there's a few deals out at Costco today. <laughs> Um, you know, we've seen a few um, food commodity uh, prices come down from their very high levels. So thinking about wheat and, uh, and corn and, and the like. And um, as Ash mentioned, you know, housing markets, they're slowing a little bit as well. And we get lower transaction volumes when that happens. And that, you know, reduces that activity when people are changing houses and that reduces demand. And then finally there we get, you know, you've, we've seen improvement in that supply chain uh, that we heard about a few months ago. So we're seeing... Uh, freight rates come down and supply chain uh, delivery uh, times improve. And also for the companies we follow, we're just hearing that production levels are a, a bit easier, uh, especially in durable goods area where there's more inventory around. So that combination, I think, will lead to, to lower uh, inflation over the, over the next year or so. And that will, you know, uh, put sort of um, alleviate some of the pressure on that uh, yield environment or rising yield environment we've seen across fixed interest markets. Thanks, Quinn. And I'm going to I'm going to go around each of you. So welcome, Sam. Um, so question for you is around whether you think New Zealand and the developed world will fall into a recession. And this is something that I know a lot of the advisors are getting from their clients at the moment. So interested in your view. Thanks, Kath, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Straight in the deep end. Thank you, Kath, <laughs> yeah. on the big R word. So I think, and this might sound a little bit shocking, I think it is fairly certain that New Zealand and indeed the globe will fall into a recession at some stage. 
And that could be in a year, that could be in five years, I do not know, but that's very, very normal. So since World War II, we'll take the key US market, for example, that's had 12 recessions. So it's, it's absolutely a part of normal life for a long-term equity investor. And, and the good news also is not only is it normal, but it's being talked about a lot too. So we all know it's been talked about in the front page of our New Zealand Herald here. But if you go to Google Trends and you look for the word recession, it has been searched as much recently as it was during the global financial crisis. That was the worst recession in 80 years. And it's been as searched as much as it was during the COVID crisis, which is when the entire global economy just halted. So both, both very savage events. And remember what Warren Buffett said, Kath, is if you could tell me with absolute certainty there was going to be a recession next year, I would still be buying and selling the same stocks as I am today. Now, I'm not sure I, if I, dare I say it, I fully agree with Warren there, but his point is twofold. Firstly, we are long-term investors and we invest on a 5, 10, 20 plus year time frame. And recessions are just part of the normal course of doing business for long-term equity investors like us. And the second point is when something's been on the front page of the newspaper, it's being talked about a lot, we can say it's at least partially baked into stock prices. So let's take those 12 recessions since World War II, for example, and take the US bellwether S&P 500. On average, that market declined by 24% from peak to trough during a, the average recession. So as of a few hours ago, the S&P 500 trades around 23 hours around the clock. Um, it's down exactly 24% from its highs. So we've already baked in the median correction for a garden variety recession. And, and we haven't even had a recession yet. So very normal, Kath. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Robbie, um, this is something that I'm, I'm very passionate about and talking about with our clients is our investment philosophy. So how do we invest? And perhaps you could explain our approach and, and what's really distinctive about it. Yeah, thanks, Kath. And, and good afternoon, everybody. It's good to be with you um, today. Uh, well, Kath, we do have a very distinctive approach. Essentially, when it comes to investing, uh, we invest in uh, very specifically in high quality companies run by really good management teams that have got long growth runways in, in, in front of them. Um, and the bedrock of how we define quality really comes down to the, the aspect of a business's makeup um, that enables it to have a strong, durable, competitive advantage. Something in how business operates that enables it to generate good profits and a good return on any money that they invest in their own operations uh, in such a way that competitors can't come in and compete that away from them. Now, this competitive advantage can sort of come from you know, a few different sources. It can, can, for example, come from a product or a service that is really important to customers and that is very difficult to switch away from. Uh, so as one example, for example, um, Xero you know, has accounting software that, that are used by many small and medium-sized businesses here in, in New Zealand. Once those, those businesses have embedded Xero into their, their business operations and they use it for, for accounting purposes, it's very unlikely that they're going to switch away from that um, you know, month in and month out and, and just try and find an alternative, an alternative accounting um, platform provider. So it means those customers tend to be really sticky and it provides a very good platform for Xero um, to, to base its business on. Allied to this, when you think about the growth angle of high quality businesses, uh, if a company does have a long growth runway in front of it, um, and in, in particular, if it's providing goods and services that customers need, uh, it means that over time, you, although we're going to go through economic cycles and their, their profits will, will rise and you know, will grow over time at different rates and they may fall from one year to the next, but over time, that, that growth runway underpins its earnings growth and in turn, share prices will tend to, in the long run, follow, follow earnings growth. Um, so, so we're very focused on, on ensuring our, our companies can grow through time. The people, the third element that I mentioned there, people and their track records matter. Uh, we don't want to partner with, um, you know, or rather we would like to only partner with people that are passionate and, uh, and fastidious about the businesses that they run and, and operate. Um, their track record uh, matters to us. Um, how they treat their clients, their colleagues and, and shareholders really matters to us. And linked to that, you know, we do invest through a responsible investing lens. So we won't invest in businesses that do harm or cause immense environmental or social damage. Now, you can tell from this list, Kat, um, that we're pretty picky about the companies that we invest in. Not many of them make the quality and growth grade. 
Um, and as a consequence of that, we tend to run concentrated portfolios um, with the best hand-picked businesses in the various markets that we invest in. Uh, and we hold these businesses for long periods of time. You know, the proof of the pudding with quality, high quality growing companies doesn't come from one month to the next. Uh, it really comes over, you know, years and years of growth and, and track record and performance. And that's what we look for in the businesses that we invest in. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. And um, I'm really delighted. We've got some uh, first time attendees here from Aon. I'm going to answer the next couple of questions. So um, uh, someone has asked, what's the current relationship between Fisher Funds and Aon? Um, so all of the Aon members are now transferred, fully transferred to the Fisher Funds KiwiSaver scheme. Um, but it's a great opportunity if you haven't already to log into the online portal, have a look at your strategy and make sure um, you're set up in, in the right fund for you. So yeah, welcome, welcome uh, along today. Uh, the second question, which I'll answer is around, uh, would you recommend opening another investment account aside from uh, KiwiSaver? So uh, we have managed funds uh, with, with Fisher Funds, which is a really flexible alternative to KiwiSaver, has a variety of different features um, in terms of um, you know, being able to uh, use it. And it's great for lump sums. My kids all have a managed fund, actually. Um, and um, yeah, regular um, contributions or putting in a lump sum. So yeah, we do have options available. Right, Quinn. Got the next couple for you, I can see you've come through. So with interest rates rising, why shouldn't I invest um, in a term deposit? Uh, well, uh, Kath, so I suppose cash uh, cash on hand or cash under the mattress or you know, cash in a bank account, term deposit, it can feel like a comfortable investment, but you know, history would suggest that you know it should be regarded as anything but comfortable because of that inflation tax, that silent tax that I mentioned earlier, um, it sort of erodes your purchasing power. So even if a um, central bank hits its 2% target, your money will halve in value over around 35 years. So I think, you know, as investors, you know, with that investor mindset, we should be, you know, looking for productive uh, investments. And that's like shares and equities in, in, in companies that uh, have good business models and can generate returns that will outstrip inflation uh, over the long, longer run. And that's, um, you know, there has been a bit of volatility, um, you know, there have some prices come down, but that means there is some some good buying uh, to be had. And you can think about, you know, that idea being like you're buying, a, you know, a slice of future prosperity at a markdown price today. So I'm sure, you know, uh, the other chaps will talk about that. But um, and, and, and indeed, in the in the fixed interest world, you know, with the rising yields, we're seeing some interesting opportunities there as as well. Yeah, so just to follow up on that, Quinn, um, what, what kind of good investment opportunities are you seeing in that fixed interest space? Oh, well, um, yeah, sure, plenty, Kath, uh, plenty. And as, as I sort of mentioned before, um, you know, with that, you know, my view is that inflation will fall over the next sort of 12 months or so, and that should improve sentiment within uh, fixed interest markets. And, um, but I'm particularly excited about uh, corporate bonds and especially corporate bonds in uh, overseas markets where they've been marked down more than, uh, local bonds. And we're starting to get to yield levels uh, there where history would suggest it's a good time to have some fixed interest within your por uh, portfolio. So uh, we have the Fisher Funds Income Fund, for example, so that yield has ticked over uh, 7%. So that's a multi-year high. And within that fund, we do have corporate bonds. And, um, you know, again, we, we, we handpick those and we select them using our uh, credit research process, making sure, you know, the, the solid business models, robust balance sheets and good people at the helm and, and in the wider crew. So, and just to give you maybe with just one example within that fund, uh, we have a position or investment in Sunny Ecos Group and they own um, resorts throughout the Mediterranean. So that's a nice mental image I'm sure can think of. But the, um, but the company was established in the, uh, the 70s. They have a great track record for uh, exceptional customer service and they target sort of those high income families uh, throughout Europe. And uh, that bond is yielding just over nine percent in New Zealand dollar terms, and we think that's pretty attractive for for a business, you know, with that that track record and quality asset base. So we'll continue to pick those kind of investments and and include them when we like that risk return sort of balance. That holiday sounds nice, yeah. <laughs> so Sam, I've got a specific question for you here, um, New Zealand question, which is around the New Zealand housing market. Um, so the New Zealand housing market seems to be in trouble. How will this flow through to the economy and share market? And are there any companies in your portfolio, uh, like Ryman, that are particularly exposed? 
Thanks, Kath. I think I prefer to talk about the uh, Mediterranean bond than the New Zealand <laughs> housing market, but it, it is definitely topical. Obviously, we're all enthusiastic about housing in New Zealand, and we've all seen the countless newspaper articles about the weak housing market. And you know, what, why is that? Well, very simply, house prices went up sharply, and now mortgage rates have gone up sharply, and that combination is pressuring house prices. So that, that will flow through to a, to a weaker economy in New Zealand. We're already seeing that. A couple of points to make on our portfolios, on our New Zealand portfolios. The first one is more than 60% of the revenue of our portfolio companies in New Zealand is coming from offshore. So take someone, someone like Fish and Buckle Healthcare, for example, 96% of the revenue comes from offshore. So perversely for those companies, a weak New Zealand economy and therefore a weak New Zealand dollar is actually helpful to the New Zealand portfolio. That's the first point. The second point is on the the more directly exposed companies, so Somerset and Ryman, for example, they absolutely have linkages to the housing market. So simply put, if a new resident wants to enter a retirement village, they probably have to sell a house in this prevailing fairly weak market to fund that uh, new retirement village unit. But that's where the linkages really stop, in my opinion. So whether a resident enters a retirement village or not, is driven by their own individual circumstances. And to give you an example of that, my, my grandmother went into a Ryman village in Whanganui a few years ago. Now, she didn't do this because of anything to do with the housing market. It was because she was living in a large house alone. And she didn't want the hassle of looking after that house. And she wanted the camaraderie that you get at happy hour or on the bowling green. And she wanted the security of living in a retirement village. And she'd owned her house in Whanganui for about 35 years. She was lucky enough to own that for a long period of time. So she couldn't have really cared less about the prevailing Whanganui housing market dynamics at the time when she entered her village. So the, the final point I'd make on, on Somerset in particular is current sales and business stress indicators are near all-time high. So really, the retirement villages have their own kind of demand supply dynamic independent of the housing market. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so I've got a few advice questions here. So I'll have a go at answering these as well. So first steps entering the investment world. So how do I start? Um, so obviously you can go online or reach out to one of the team and they can help you. Um, there's really no minimum worth um, you know, investing. You, I think the thing is getting into a habit of investing and thinking really around the long time. It's not short term, it's just long term investing. Um, so with a managed fund, you can start from $100 per month or, or put in a lump sum. But yeah, getting into that habit of long-term investing is, is really good. I've also got another question just come through around strategy and volatility, um, particularly around I've just turned 65, what should I do? When should I consider my portfolio? Um, and this is when it's really important to have a conversation with one of the team and they can go through your circumstances and work out what's the right thing for you to do. Um, and it's important to remember that with, with your KiwiSaver uh, money, that's there for your whole of retirement. So having a discussion with the team and working out um, the sort of money that you'll need for now and in the future um, is a really good, um, good idea and putting a plan in place around the kind of strategy that you should be in. So those are my two done. Robbie, I hear you haven't been traveling to some flash resorts maybe, but you have been visiting some of our Australian companies, I understand. What are you hearing from them and how are, how are their businesses impacted right now by the economic uncertainty and are you worried? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kath. Um, yeah, I was in Australia last week and, uh, you know, I've caught up with a, a lot of our companies, obviously, through COVID over, over Zoom, but it was good to catch up with a number of them in person. Uh, and the businesses that we met, um, we focused on the, you know, a, a lot of the domestic oriented um, exposures that we have in the, in the portfolio. On the whole, I'd just say the the tone from these from the companies is, is quite circumspect. You know, on the one hand, the domestic economy in Australia um, is performing quite well in this environment. It's quite buoyant there at the moment. If you go over, consumers are spending. The job market is very tight and, and strong. The post pandemic relaxation of, of COVID restrictions and return to freer life is is well in train, much as it is here in New Zealand. Um, there is inflation, you know, that, that that is rising in Australia, not as fast as we've seen in the US, but inflation is coming through. Many of the companies that we spoke to um, that, that we invest in uh, are managing to increase prices and more than, than offset those inflationary pressures, which is, is great and actually is a sign of, of the sort of quality that we look for in companies, the ability to, um, to, to increase prices and protect their profit base. 
Um, also, supply chains, uh, you know, supply chain restrictions that, you know, Quinn sort of alluded to when he, when he spoke earlier about um, some of those inflationary pressures being, being eased because supply chain restrictions are easing. Uh, we're seeing that domestically as well, um, particularly offshore freight rates. So um, goods that are being imported to Australia, the costs of doing that are, are starting to, to come down, which is, which is pleasing. Um, but on the cautious side, it's, you know, everybody that we spoke to, or well, most of the people that we spoke to there are really focused about next year. You know, we've had interest rates, a lot of interest rate increases from the Reserve Bank in Australia because of the nature of, of the way mortgages are fixed in the Australian market, a little bit similar to New Zealand with one and two year fixed. It takes time for those in interest rate increases to come through um, household balance sheets. And so, um, you know, the banks in particular are just a bit cautious about what that will mean uh, for, for, um, for mortgages and, and households uh, into 2023. Um, so people are taking pretty prudent steps around that. Um, I wouldn't say that they're alarmed because the unemployment rate is low and the employment market is tight, um, but they, I guess they, they, they watch for and alert. Thanks, Robbie. So I'm now going to go, we're going to a little bit broader. Um, so Sam, there's significant geopolitical tension currently. How much risk does a war in Ukraine and the European energy shortage pose? Yeah, that there is a lot of ge geopolitical risk at the moment, um, and not least of that is the human tragedy in Ukraine. But on the European energy crisis specifically, I think, Kath, which is where a lot of this geopolitical risk is kind of showing its face or manifesting, just a couple of facts there. So more than a quarter of Europe's energy requirement comes from natural gas. And while natural gas is a commodity, and therefore, you know, we love commodities, um, to understand them because they're classic economics 101. High prices usually means a little bit of a reduction in demand, more people bring on supply um, in response to that higher price and things equalize. However, natural gas is not as freely transportable across the ocean as oil, for example. So it's got very low density, imagine gas. Um, so it's very large volume in its natural form. So it needs to be liquef liquefied, which massively reduces the volume, but the catch is, that setting up large scale liquefied natural gas facilities is very expensive and takes time. So that supply response takes time to that current energy shock. The second thing to remember about natural gas or about Europe in general is 25% of that, sorry, of that 25% of Europe's energy needs that come from natural gas, 35% of it comes from Russia. So Europe is reliant on a non easily transportable commodity from an unstable neighbor. So that, that's the issue. And, and the so what of that is, since the invasion, um, the tragic invasion of Ukraine, German natural gas prices, for example, have spiked to around $50 per MMBTU, which is a standard metric measure for, for natural gas. And that's 10 times what they were before all of this started. And that gas is used to generate electricity. So gas prices feed directly into German and European power prices. And that means power prices are up five to tenfold as well. So that that's important. That's important for Europe. That's important for New Zealand as well, because Europe is New Zealand's third biggest trading partner. But it's, it's really important to remember that New Zealand itself is in a lucky or enviable position when it comes to energy reliance or energy security. So we do rely on natural gas for our energy needs to the tune of about 20% of our, our total energy needs. But rather than being produced by an unstable neighbor, not that we've got any of those down here, of course, Robbie, um, but th that's all produced domestically. And most of that's in the Taranaki region where I'm from actually. So, so while European, Europe's natural gas price is up tenfold to 50 bucks, our natural gas price in New Zealand has been really stable and sitting around $7. So again, Europe's reliant on that, uh, on that unstable neighbor and we're not. So I think that's an important distinction down here, Kath. Mm. And, and going and going uh, closer to home as well. Um, this is for you, Ash. I know there was there was quite a, a, a few uh, questions around um, the government announced a GST tax on KiwiSaver fees. Um, so tell us about that and, and new taxes like this a risk and how worried should investors be? Well, certainly no one likes new taxes. Um, and it did come as a real surprise to, to the industry. Um, and it was also very disappointing, I guess. 
Um, I guess New Zealand, in New Zealand, we were a bit behind the curve in terms of other countries in terms of preparing for retirement. Um, and part of that was because we didn't really have a national savings scheme until 15 years ago. Um, and KiwiSaver really is a great vehicle for that. And we've seen a lot of, you know, a lot of young people starting to save for their retirement. Um, that's helped a lot of people over the last 15 years, both prepare for retirement, but also buy a home. So I think it's really important that we don't um, we don't change anything there. Um, thankfully, though, there was only headlines on it for a few hours before the um, there was a change in policy and, and the tax has um we've decided not to bring the tax in effectively and i think um it was probably a good reminder for for politicians generally that a lot of people really value their kiwi saver you know and it essentially should be off limits um for new taxes and that sort of thing at, at the same time it's important to remember the tax that was proposed was just on fees on kiwi saver it wasn't a tax on kiwi saver balances which some some clients got that wrong and mm -hmm. Rightfully, if that was the case, people would be hugely concerned. But it was a, at the end of the day, it would have been a reasonably small cost for investors. Um, but but nonetheless, not not a great one. But but bigger picture, I guess I'm I'm hopeful um, for KiwiSaver. It is a great vehicle, as I mentioned earlier, for people saving for retirement. And what we've seen generally overseas is as these schemes have got bigger and people have contributed more over time, governments tend to focus more on them in, in terms of providing incentives to to save more and contribute more. And I, I really hope that as we push ahead here, that we will start to see more incentives for people to contribute. Um, but even if we don't, I think it's a great scheme and you know it has helped a lot of people get into homes and prepare for retirement. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. So Robbie, a question for you around um, as active investors, what are you doing to reposition portfolios in this environment? Yeah, um, Kat, there are good opportunities that are being presented because in this environment, we are seeing you know, shares uh, being sold off somewhat indiscriminately in line with some of these macro pressures, um, despite the fact that a, you know, a number of companies are, are operating quite well. Um, within within their own businesses. So what we've been doing is we've been not making massive changes to our portfolio. We we do have um, you know a really good bunch of about twenty five companies in Australian equity portfolio, for example. But we have been tilting capital and adding to positions in some of these high quality names that we have in the portfolio that have long growth runways and whose share prices have been um, you know have been we think unduly punished in this environment. One such example is Domino's, uh, which you know people will be familiar with here in New Zealand. They um, they sell pizzas, you know, in, in Australia, New Zealand, a number of companies in countries in Europe, which um, has got the market somewhat concerned in this environment, as well as Japan, um, and, and they've just acquired a business um, in Southeast Asia as well. Now, Domino's share price, because people are concerned, particularly around their the European franchise, uh, its share price is now back to 2019 levels, sort of pre-COVID levels. Yet between 2019 and now. Its earnings are actually up, you know, this coming year will be up 30% on where they were in 2019. Allied to that, we, you know, we, we see this business doubling their, their store footprint over the course of the next, you know, six to eight years. Um, and that's just been further corroborated by this, this recently um, acquired business in Southeast Asia that's also going to add to its store footprint. So it's a really solid business. Um, it is managing to, to um, you know, to, to do quite well in this environment. One of the, I guess, the points of feedback from Australia is that the, um, you know, the fast service, the QSR, the fast service restaurant market is doing quite well, particularly those, uh, um, those fast food manufacturers that service the value end of the spectrum, which Domino's does serve. Um, and so we think its long-term out out earnings outlook is good. Uh, it's a strong franchise and its share price is, is reasonably cheap. So we're adding to a business like that um, and, and similar other high quality businesses. And we are using as funding sources a little bit of cash as well as just reducing our weighting in some more defensive companies that have done really well for us in this environment and hung in there, but, but aren't necessarily as cheap as um, some of these businesses that have been unduly punished. So we're just tilting capital within the book, but there's some really good opportunities that are starting to open up um, in the equity market, I think. Right. I think my kids, both my uni student and my youngest, love their dominoes. So we're, we're doing well there, particularly the gluten-free bases. Yeah, that, that uh, might, <laughs> let's order a few more, Kat. <laughs> yeah. Quinn, this is a really good question, which um, has come through. And actually, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Christchurch and met some of our clients, and, and they were asking similar sorts of questions there, which is, um, do you think KiwiSaver providers can do more to support local companies and New Zealand Inc. more broadly? Um, yeah, no, that's a fair question. Um, yeah, and a bit of a timely one for the fixed interest team, because we do we're in the process of launching a, a new fund uh, called the Australasian Private Debt Fund, and that will have the ability to lend directly to uh, local uh, companies. So 
we'll have some more uh, you know information to share about that fund uh, in the in the coming months. Uh, but as I say, it has that ability uh, to lend directly, and uh, but that's only after again we put it through our process and also making sure we're you know negotiating a, a fair return. And I think the other thing is probably important to note that um, that's this is not something new for our fixed interest team. Uh, many well, hopefully a few of our uh, participants today will know that we've been big supporters of the TR Group story, for instance, and that's a private company that we've helped to fund their operations and their sort of growth opportunities. And we're, we're looking for some of the kind of uh, opportunities to those. So I think, yes, there's, you know, uh, can we do more? Yeah, I, I think so. And we're doing more. And um, as I say, I, you know, we'll look out for some some uh, material and literature on that in the, in the coming months. Great. I'm sure it will be um, asked a lot after this for. So that's great. So Ash, this is a question around um, Fisher Funds recent acquisition of Kiwi Wealth. And what does this mean for Fisher Funds investors? And is there going to be any changes to the team or how, how we invest? Yeah, so it's a really exciting transaction for the, the Fisher Funds team. And, and we think we will ultimately add a lot of capability that'll be great for clients as well. Um, and through time, in a client recently, or just on the call then, just asked about Aon, which was a business we bought last year. But before that as well, we had bought Tower Investments. So we do have a history of making acquisitions, but the reason we do that is to gain scale and add new capabilities. So through those acquisitions, we've added capabilities in areas like um, investments, advice, technology. And with Kiwi, we think there's a, a lot of opportunity to, it'll add a lot of scale. Um, it'll provide us capability to add new investment offerings, um, more advisors, which we know we really need to have a bigger footprint around the country to talk to our clients. And also they have some, some great thoughts on technology and we need to keep improving our technology offering as well. So I think um, I think it's a really good opportunity. And just examples of that, of things that we've used as we've gained more scale, we've set up a number of um, new equity portfolios through time, most recently a new international value portfolio, which is already benefiting our, our Kiwi Saver clients. And Quinn mentioned that um, private credit fund, which we're setting up, but we're also setting up a, a global credit fund as well. So there's, there's a lot of opportunities that will allow us to add more capability on the investment side. And we think that will result in better risk adjusted returns longer term. Um, but also in, in your part of the business, Kath, we've got offices currently in Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch. And we really are keen to, to expand that because we've found as we have opened more offices, it's given us a chance to engage with clients. A lot of clients still really value face-to-face -face advice. And that's a, a really important part of our offering as well. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's excellent. So I'm going to I'm going to throw this to Robbie, Sam, or whoever wants to jump in. So with financial markets firing lower, when you see your portfolio company share prices going down, what gives you the comfort to sleep at night? I, I, I'll have a crack at that first, and Sam and Sam can jump in, Kath. It's um well, it's it's, it's not great. It's not it's not ideal. You wouldn't want your share prices to just spiral low. It, it, no. you know, it, it can make you second guess yourself. But when I think, you know, of just the investment philosophy that I outlined earlier, um, you know, that we do invest in high quality businesses run by good management teams, you know, and, and that do grow over time, um, we can never predict what's going to happen, you know, over the next few months from an economic perspective and economic cycles will come and go. Um, but those characteristics that we focus in on from an investment philosophy and investment process standpoint really has stood the test of time. And it's probably that that gives me the most comfort that, um, I know businesses' earnings will, will suffer if we go into an economic recession, um, but I also have comfort because of the nature of the people that are running these businesses, that they are taking prudent steps now to position themselves to come out the back end of whatever slowdown happens and when it happens, um, you know, all, all the stronger for it. Um, you know, if I think of the characteristics, the financial characteristics, for example, of our Australian um, portfolio businesses, uh, we have 20% to 25% lower debt levels on average across our businesses compared to, um, you know, the, the, the ASX 200. Uh, our firms are growing, you know, their profits faster, their profit margins are higher, their returns on capital that they invest in their businesses are higher. And what's really pleased me over the last year, as tough as it's been, particularly in the last, you know, in the last um, sort of eight months, is that our companies have kept on investing in their businesses to increase the platform for growth later on when conditions do improve and some of these nearer term concerns subside. So we've had CSL, for example, which is sort of a large healthcare business that collects plasma and makes 
plasma-based um, based products for, for people with, um, with, with blood-related deficiencies. They've spent over a billion dollars US this last year in R&D. And in addition to that, they've also gone out and acquired an adjacent business in the kidney market, um, providing kidney, solu um, kidney treatments for people with chronic kidney disease. Uh, because they, you know, they want to diversify their earnings base. They want to add what they think is an attractive new segment to their growth runway. Um, they haven't stood back because they're worried about, you know, interest rates rising and so on. They've moved forward. Um, you know, we've had WiseTech, which is a software business that we're invested in in Australia. They spent $180 million in R&D this last year. Um, again, this is adding to their ability to keep growing over the next five, 10 years. Um, and it's all of that combined with, you know, just a good solid business that gives um, that gives me the comfort. Yeah. Sometimes I feel Sam, Sam, do you want to add anything else to that? <laughs> uh, just one example, like maybe three things is quality companies means expert management teams um, that are well prepped to cope with the slowdown. And just one example there is Main Freight, for example. So when you talk to Don Braid and team, it is clear the company's learned a lot from previous downturns. So take the New Zealand business back in the global financial crisis, for example, it was a more, more mature business. They were ready and profitability or, or margins actually improved during the, the GFC because the company was very quick to cut costs. And this might sound like a really small thing, but imagine 300 plus branches around the world. Imagine the maintenance that goes on in those branches and that's normally outsourced to third parties. And all of us on this call know that you outsource anything to a third party when it comes to maintenance these days, it's really expensive. Well, when things slow down, they start to do that maintenance internally. They do it themselves. And that's just one little thing that saves them a lot of money. And, and why do they think like that? It's because every single person of the 10,000 strong workforce around the world shares in the profit of their local branch. So they all think like business owners. Yeah, thank you. So Robbie, I've got a few questions, some about gold, some about Bitcoin, crypto, so what about what about these? Is now a good time to invest or layer them into our, our portfolios? What do you think? <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the million dollar question. Um, Kath, I'll split though, I, I guess I'll split that into, into two components and deal with Bit, Bitcoin or crypto first. Um, you know, Bitcoin is down 60% year to date. So to the extent that um, it has been touted as being a digital gold and a sort of a harbor of safety in rocky times, it's been anything but over the course of the last nine months. Um, you know, its volatility has been a lot more than share markets, not less. Uh, it hasn't protected investors to the downside when, when economic times, are, you know, ha has got tough. Um, so for me, that still remains an experiment. Um, it'll be interesting to see how crypto um, assets evolve over time. But for now, I, I'd, I'd stay clear of those um, because they don't, I, I, they, they don't have the characteristics that um, I think um, people people say that they should have in times like these. Uh, in addition to that, I guess from our perspective, you know, crypto or, or um, um, Bitcoin is not, you know, it doesn't earn any income. So there's no sort of cash flow metric upon which we can base the valuation. So we tend to steer clear of, of um, I guess, assets that, that have those characteristics. And that plays into the second part of the of the of the question, which I guess you know relates to gold. Um, gold similarly doesn't earn an income, so you know sitting there and trying to value it and figure out when a good time is to invest in gold is, is quite tough. Um, what I would say with gold is it obviously has a long history of being a store of value, um, and there is an argument to suggest that gold should form part of people's diversified portfolios because um, over centuries it's proved to be a bellwether in times when company countries have mismanaged themselves and in you know, in an era of fiat currency, um, that's the argument that, that is often put forward for gold. On the other side of that, though, in a world in which we have rising interest rates and real interest rates, um, there's a, a strong argument for gold going lower um, than, than, than where it is because, uh, you know, in a rising interest rate environment, um, the cost to store gold and the cost to protect it, because ultimately you've got, you know, you've got to keep it somewhere, um, that goes up uh, relative to what you could earn with that money by putting it in a term deposit or putting it in a fixed income product, um, for example. Uh, so th there's, there's a negative bear argument on, on gold as well as we see these interest rates um, increase. Um, so for me, um, I understand the logic of gold, but it, it's, it's very much in the too hard basket. I'd far rather sit and analyze productive assets like shares and companies and figure out uh, where their valuations are going to go over a longer, longer period of time. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. 
I think we've got time for a, f a couple more questions. So um, with Quinn, I'm going to throw one to you. We've had lots of questions come through around inflation, uh, US dollar strength in one form of another. Um, yep. So, yeah, do you want to kind of talk around that or make comment on that? Um, yeah, sure. So, you know, when there's periods of volatility, I think maybe, um, you know, people observing that the dollar, uh, the US dollar is strengthening against most currencies. Uh, but it's, you know, it's important to remember for New Zealand, we do trade with Australia, uh, the UK, Europe, uh, as well as the US and other sort of dollar regions. So if we're thinking about the impact of a stronger US dollar on, uh, on New Zealand inflation, we've got to think more about that. It's called the trade weighted index. So the basket of, of, of currencies we trade in and um, that that fall for the New Zealand dollar has been much less dramatic. So, so I'll respond to that. Yeah, thank you. Ash, we've had a few questions here um, around, you know, investors and our clients have seen what's been happening in their portfolios. What should they do? Should they change their strategy, you know, take money out, put money in? Is this a good time? So what's kind of a sensible way for, our, you know, both our KiwiSaver and our managed funds and premium clients to really, you know, um, react to the current kind of turmoil or what's happening? Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. I saw a few come through on it for different perhaps age groups as well. But but I guess, yeah. first of all, the question is always an interesting one because it's, it's what we get at times like these. It's, you know, it's basically implying people think they should be doing something different now than they were a, a few months ago. And I guess that's what happens in periods of uncertainty and volatility. People want to take control and they want to you know feel like they're, they're doing something. Um, at the same time, that often results in people um, following others, following the crowd. It's sort of quite well documented. And actually what, what that would imply at the moment would be um, to follow others selling things when actually doing the exact opposite might be the right thing. So you do have to be careful, um, you know, just doing too much when, when markets are volatile and the right thing with your portfolio to do might be to do to do nothing but it does but that comes down to you having been in the right strategy to start with for your your risk tolerance and your investment plans or your investment goals ha having not changed so if your goals haven't changed and you're, and you're in the right fund to start with then i would say the right thing to do is generally to do nothing and, and maybe even contribute more but it's always a good chance to come in and, and check in with with your advisor and chat to someone just to make sure um, you are in the right strategy for you and you don't need to adjust your investment plans um, and as perhaps linking back to questions, uh, to Quinn's point earlier about more attractive investment opportunities, we're seeing you know, opportunities we haven't seen, seen for quite some time, whether it's in an income fund with the yield now around 7%, that is significantly more attractive. And, and that's the flip side of markets having been weak. So the, the flip side of things being weak is actually there are, there are better opportunities ahead. And I did, um, I saw one question there come through about someone that's 65 and just um, figuring out what to do with KiwiSaver. And again, it's a perfect time to come in and talk to someone. Um, my parents are in a similar situation. They're just uh, almost 70. And and the, the thing for them, I always say, is you need to remember that you're going to need some of, hopefully you're going to need some of this money in 20 years' time. So there's a certain amount of your money that you need to make sure will grow through retirement and a certain amount that you just want to make sure is stable. So it's a matter of trying to get the right balance between growth assets and, and more conservative assets. But I think the reality is, is everyone needs to still be in, investing through retirement and it makes sense to talk to someone about that. Yeah, exactly. That's great. All right, we've, we've, we probably have a few questions um, that we can get back to anybody that have asked if we haven't answered those today. And as, as we've mentioned, um, talk to your advisor or pick up the phone to our great client services team uh, and they'll be able to answer any questions that you have. Just a reminder, it is recorded, so we will send it out so um, we can share that with you. And otherwise, I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. And thanks, Ash, Quinn, Sam and Robbie. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.